Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're going to try and help you figure out how to maximize your forgiveness on um, the incentive programs that are available for COVID-19 and also try and help you stay within the bounds of federal regulations um, uh, so that you don't endanger any of your awards or your business. So the um, agenda for today is Bethany's going to start off with the SBA's Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. We now, um, people are getting those loan, officer, loan offers and we're closing on those loan offers and the money's actually being deposited. So now it's time for you to start thinking about what are the implications of accepting that uh, uh, loan award? Um, what can you spend it on and how does it have to be paid back? So Bethany's gonna help you with all of that. And then I've got a few slides to update you about the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, we're in the middle of most people's spending periods for um, forgiveness on that program. And just last week, the uh, Treasury um, released the forgiveness application. So we know a lot more about uh, that program and they've uh, granted some flexibility on how you spend that and still get forgiven. So. We're gonna cover both those topics. And um, just a housekeeping note, if you have any questions as we go, just type them into the chat box. We'll also use that chat box to share any links that we need to to um, help you access any additional information that we referenced during the talk. At the end of this uh, session, the slides that we show, those are uh, free and open on the web, so you'll be able to link to those anytime, and we'll get this video uploaded to YouTube if you want to share it with anybody else or reference anything we said again. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Bethany to get started on SBA. Okay. On EIDL, sorry. Yeah. No problem. Okay. So Jim and Christy, I'm not sure if you're in the queue for this loan or not. Um, we're, we're doing the full program here because uh, we're recording this to share with other folks. We know a lot of our small businesses downtown have been in this queue and we want them to understand where they might be in receiving their advance as part of the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. And as Josh mentioned, loan awards are now not only being um, issued, but um, they're also being deposited and i apologize i just skipped there um so um the streamline application there were actually three versions of the application for this program but the simple one and the one that was created after the cares act um it opened on monday march the 30th and they called it the streamline application it was a very simple three-page application and in that application you had the opportunity at the very end to click do you want to be considered for an advance? Those advances, which are essentially a grant, forgivable monies, have been being deposited um, over the last few weeks. This application program was, um, this loan program, that online application was actually closed on April 16th, we believe, Thursday the 16th. So they have almost made it through their whole application queue in depositing these grants that are $1,000 per employee on your team. So these advances started appearing a few weeks ago. No heads up from um, the SBA. They just show up as a deposit in your account. So if you were a late applier to this program, just continue to keep checking uh, your banking account, the account that you, um, you know, issued or submitted to the SBA when you applied as part of this program a few weeks ago. Um, there's one woman we've been working with very closely who is in the queue and she applied on the 15th and she has not received her advance yet. So they've almost made it through, but there are some folks at the end who have not seen this appear or be deposited in their uh, business banking account just yet. So uh, folks who applied in that first week, that first week starting on Monday, March 30th, are now getting emails from the SBA and they are asking them to go and create a loan portal account. And, and they say well, you're going to need to submit some additional information. It's very basic information for most applicants. You verify your identity, their typical credit questions. And then you also just verify that the banking information they have is where you're going to want this loan award deposited. All right. I don't know why. There we go. So um, we don't know the calculations that the SBA is using to determine the loan award. We've seen some different things. They, they don't 
uh, tend to hold. I'd say right now the average loan size for small businesses in middle Georgia is probably anywhere from 50 to 60,000 is the average that you get offered. When you go into the loan portal, when you create your account in that portal, you're gonna have the option to decline the award altogether, which we do not recommend, request a smaller amount than the award they offer, which in a few instances might be appropriate or accept the complete award. Um, and as I said, the follow-up documentation that they ask of you is very minimal when you go in to create the portal account. Um, and so all the awards now that we're seeing, the loan awards, are 30-year terms. So this is exceptional. I mean, you don't even get a lot of real estate loans on 30-year terms. So it's a 30-year term and the interest rates are holding exactly as how they stated they would be at the beginning of issuing the program, 2.75 for nonprofits and 3.75 for businesses. Um, you also will not have to make any payments the first year of holding the loan. So interest will accrue, but you will not have a first payment due until one year after you close the loan. Um, there is mention in loan closing documents, we've seen these now, that you have the option to request an increase of your loan award within two years of issue of your loan approval. We don't see anywhere in the portal where you can request that, and it's not clear in the loan documents how you do that. So if that's something that you seriously want to explore, if you think the award is really not helping you meet you know, some immediate uh, needs that you have as a result of the pandemic, then talk to your SBA loan officer and see what would be involved to be considered for a loan increase. Um, this was one thing we weren't really sure how they were gonna handle. So when you apply for a loan, they want all lenders want you to offer something uh, to secure the loan, to help make them whole in the event that you are not able to continue to make payments on your loan, or so that they can put a lien on there to give you a little pressure to keep paying off that loan. So um, this is unique. They're not gonna come around and, and uh, inventory what kind of business assets you have or personal assets that you have, which is very common when you do a, a typical business loan. They just, in the closing documents, uh, include an array of typical business assets, and they're saying you're going to pledge these as collateral. And, and it's um, clear that they're going to come in behind any other lender that you currently have. Okay, so um, if you, for some reason, do not want to collateralize uh, any of your business assets, there could be a few different reasons, uh, personally or professionally or as a nonprofit, you don't then consider accepting a $25,000 uh, loan award where they're not gonna file a lien against your business assets and you, you'll just have that $25,000 loan. Um, and, and then just be aware that if you sell major assets or you put another lender in a superior position to the SBA, that's not probably gonna become an issue unless you default, they're not gonna be able to monitor these things that closely, but just be aware that you, know, you need to honor that they are gonna be uh, above any other lender should you need additional uh, business financing as you move forward out of the pandemic. Um, so minimal closing fee, there is a $100 closing fee if your loan is collateralized and that's just simply for the uh, Uniform Commercial Co Code lien filing fee. There's still no prepayment penalties. This is one of the many reasons we want people to accept these loan awards. Um, and just know that there is a requirement that within 12 months of the issue of the closing documents, not when the loan closes, but within the, from the issue of the loan closing documents, um, that you are gonna have to secure hazard insurance. So they, they've got those parameters outlined in more detail in the closing documents, but just be aware that that's gonna be an expense if you're not currently that's not currently part of your typical business expenses that you're going to need to include in your financial projections. Um, so uh, if you were offered an idle advance and you have a PPP loan, that idle advance amount is going to be subtracted on the PPP side. Okay. So, and, and some folks got the idle advance prior to closing their PPP loan and it wasn't subtracted. But based on everything we've read, the, the SBA is gonna be sure that that idle advance is deducti deducted from the forgivable loan uh, award amount on the PPP side. So just be aware of that. Don't count on that money on the PPP side if you have that loan, um, because I think you'll be disappointed when, when they don't forgive it, when you submit your, um, your spending reports, which Josh is gonna talk about in detail on the PPP side in a minute. 
Um, the economic injury disaster loan monies are, it's much more flexibility in this program as far as how you can spend the monies. The key things that they outline in the closing documents are it's not supposed to finance expansion, distribution of borrowers assets or bonuses to the owner or voluntary relocation. And then they should also not cover losses compensated by other sources. And really the two critical things here that we can think of is that you're supposed to be very clear and the SBA really points this out on the PPP side that whatever you spend your PPP loan monies on should not be what you spend your idle monies on. So you're just gonna need to do some good bookkeeping there to show that you're spending your idle monies on other operational expenses. Uh, focus on the PPP, this is so restrictive, and then use the idle to fill in all your other needs. And then if you are going to get any insurance payouts, just be sure that you're not spending your idle money on the thing that those payouts are, are supposed to uh, help support or make up for. Um, and in the loan documents, they do encourage all borrowers to purchase American-made products or equipment with these federal funds. Um, also, bookkeeping, just be aware that the SBA is requiring you to keep track of how you spend these economic injury disaster loan monies, and they expect you to, to keep the receipts, keep all spending records for three years from the issue of your final loan award. Um, and like all loans, they've got the requirement that you need to be able to submit financial statements to them should they be requested. And the window that they're looking at is five years back from the date of any financial record request they might issue. Um, and all the way as far forward as three years after your loan closes or you pay it in full. Um, in the event that your organization or business has been denied or you know folks who have, we have seen this in a few cases, either around personal credit, some of the federal lending parameters um, th that you check yes or no on in the application itself that they let folks get through but then denied them or we've seen folks getting denied based on uh, the premise of no economic injury, which so far what we've seen is someone who's just gotten open, such low sales that that has not, um, they don't merit getting the support um, because they're basing these decisions on getting you back to pre-disaster levels of business. So should you know anyone or should you want your application to be reconsidered, this is the email to use um and you would want to go ahead as you correspond with this contact at the sba to include at that time any kind of information that would help them you know reconsider their their grounds for um denying you in the first round and just uh one last piece because we, we've gone through this a lot with some folks who are like who have talked with us about not accepting the economic injury disaster loan because they've gotten a PPP and they've gotten the advance and and otherwise business is looking good and strong and steady and we we continue to really encourage folks to go ahead and accept the award um, because we don't know what's going to happen in the months ahead we've got a lot of uncertainty here until we've got a vaccine and how it's going to impact our business flows and supply chains um, they're exceptionally low monthly payments with these term and interest rates. I just uh, switched to this slide and, and you can see that even, even a good business loan doesn't compare as far as monthly payments. But what we really don't want folks to do is get in a cash crunch pinch, say come holiday season, and they start putting all of their um, expenses on a credit card or they take out one of these quick online loans that are, I mean, essentially predatory and have insane APR rates, that if you just go ahead and accept this one, even if you don't spend any of it, um, you're just gonna have that comfort and that cushion. The, there's no loan out there where your collateral is gonna be um, just sort of blanketly issued. Typically, they, they, underwriters go through a lot of scrutiny to determine if you have the kind of collateral quality they want. And it's hard to get loans during times like this when income isn't good and you know expenses may be getting high once deferments um, expire. So this may be one of the only ways to get a little bit of financial support during these uncertain months ahead. And, and we just can't emphasize enough that there's no prepayment penalty. So I ran the math on a, a $50,000 loan. Let's say they offer you $50,000 that you take and you for a whole year just sit on that money, if you don't use it at all and you pay them off in full, it's gonna cost you about $2,000 between the closing fee and the interest that accrues, 
but that would be, you know, $2,000 of comfort to know that you have totally gotten yourself covered. Um, so the only time we would not recommend someone not taking this award is if really already they are so burdened with debt or expenses that, that they can't, um, they can't absorb this additional cost. And what, one last thing to know is that you have two months from the time they issue the loan award until you have to decide if you want to accept it. So if you or anyone you know is trying to decide if they can take on more debt, we are happy to work with you to run your financial projections and determine if you can absorb this loan or maybe, maybe get a reduced loan award um, in order to get that assistance and still be able to make payments and, and run in, in the black instead of the red. So that's all the info I had on the economic injury disaster loan, Josh. I think that was great. Thank you. Um, so as y'all are thinking about anything on the economic injury disaster loan side, if you want to go ahead and type your questions into the chat box, we'll start, we'll start thinking about those and, and be ready to respond. I'm going to move on and talk about the, um, Paycheck Protection Program now. Um, and I'm going to review a little bit from our last slideshow about, um, about this program and uh, take you forward to what we know now. So um, one of the things we know about the Paycheck Protection Program is they made your loan amount based on two and a half uh, months of your salary um, salaries for 2019 but they only made the but you only have eight weeks of a forgiveness period to spend it so um, so they made the loan big enough to cover almost 11 weeks of pay payroll but you've got to spend it in eight weeks so um, we walked through this example of a for-profit business with a $620,000 payroll with benefits. Um, and they had one employee who made more than $125,000, the owner. That has to be reduced. No one can make more than $100,000. So um, in this case, their loan award was um, $125,000. And 75% of that has to be spent on payroll and 25% has to be spent on these three other categories, which are utilities, loan interest, and rent. Um, so in this case, with $125,000 award, that meant 94,000 on payroll and about 31,000 on other expenses. But when this company ran the numbers, eight weeks only adds up to $92,000 in payroll expenses. So um, they're not gonna have enough salary expense to use all the loan proceeds. And um, the other expenses that they have um, only add up to, uh, so they've got rent, they've got a loan from the person they bought this business from, they've got a secured line of credit, and then they have utility bills that are cell phones, landlines, electricity, gas, water, and internet. Um, and so those other expenses over eight weeks only add up to $18,000, but the other category was eligible up to $31,000. So, um, so actually in this case, in both cases, they're falling short. Uh, the bottom line is that it's entirely probable you're not gonna be able to generate enough eligible expenses to get the entire loan forgiven. And so if you can't, your first option is to just not spend it. So the portions of this PPP loan that you can't spend on forgivable um, expenses, don't spend at all. And you just pay those back immediately to the lender and that will cost you nothing. Uh, your section, second option is to pay it back according to the loan documents. Um, for the loan documents for Truist, the repayment term is 24 months from the date of the loan, which is when you got your money. Uh, it's charged 1% interest from the beginning, and you don't have to start making payments for seven months, but then you have to make a payment um, over the next 17 months that will fully pay off the loan. So that's a really quick repayment period. So for this example, there was about $13,000 in unforgiven expenses. So the monthly payment uh, for those 17 months is going to be 800 bucks a month, which is a lot. 
So that, that's the second option. If you do choose to spend all this money and you don't spend it on um, forgivable functions, um, you have to pay it back really quick. So the summary of that is you probably cannot get the entire loan forgiven. Um, but we're going to try and tell you about the changes that SBA has made to maximize your chances of getting it um, forgiven. So one of the things, uh, sort of a baseline issue, to qualify for forgiveness, you had to rehire 100% of your employees. Um, the, the new application has clarified this for you. The forgiveness application counts your employees in terms of full-time equivalents. So basically, that's hours worked. They want to see that you have the same number of hours being worked um, from 2019 as you do now. So it doesn't matter if your individual employees change. If someone leaves and someone new comes on, or if, um, for instance, let's say someone leaves and the rest of your staff members are willing to pick up those extra hours, they're counting hours. So um, you can definitely rehire different people. That was something we weren't sure about last week. Now we know. They also are giving you until June 30th to return to 100%. So it's possible for you to get forgiveness on the people you are working, even if that's not 100% of the hours that were being worked before the crisis, as long as by June 30th, um, the hours worked are 100%. The other thing that changed significantly last week was um, the SBA issued a safe harbor for uh, demonstrating need. So when you applied for the Paycheck Protection Program loan, you had to guarantee, you had to promise them that the current economic uncertainty um, required you to get this loan. And there really was no circumstance, there was really no test that said, okay, well, how does the SBA know if you really did need it or not? Well, what they've decided is that if you took less than $2 million, they are going to take your word for it that you needed it. There will be no additional scrutiny, underwriting, auditing to determine whether you had other options, like you were sitting on a big endowment or uh, you had cash savings or um, your income streams weren't impaired yet. They're not going to look into any more of that. The important thing to know about this loan, though, about this safe harbor, though, is it only applies to whether you needed the money or not. It has nothing to do with your forgiveness or not. So they are still applying the same standards to evaluate um, whether you get forgiven or not no matter what your loan amount was. Um, so this only applies to whether you needed the money or not. The next thing that happened on last Friday was they actually released the application for forgiveness. Um, one big thing to know here is that the forgiveness is gonna be handled by the SBA directly, not the lender who issued your loan. So your lender really has no um, role or discretion in determining whether your expenses qualify. And, um, Bethany or James, if you don't mind popping this link into the uh, chat box, oops, sorry. But you can now download this um, application. It's called SBA Form 3508. You can either just Google that or you can click this link and download the application directly. And it's got all the new instructions and approvals for forgiveness. So to tell you, uh, to summarize those again, the, the split has not changed. We, we wondered if it might, but you're still required to spend 75% of your loan on um, payroll and 25% on other. We have gotten a little bit of clarity on the other category. They have specifically permitted electricity, gas, water, transportation, telephone, and internet access as the types of eligible utilities. So if it's not on this list, it's unlikely to be forgivable. Um, the other big thing that's changed is um, on rental agreements. We knew that rental real estate counted. If you were renting the places that your business operates, that was an eligible expense. But they've also stated that personal property now counts. So if you have um, a rental agreement on, say, a copy machine, that is an eligible expense in the other category. Um, it just needs to have been in place on February 15th. Um, so that may help a few people out. Um, the other thing uh, for, your, for your other expenses, your eight week period still begins as, on the date you got your money. So that has not changed at all. So for this category of utilities, loan interest and rent, 
that period still starts on the day you got the money. Um, and how you, you're going to need verification for these other expenses, and that's going to include um, if you choose to include any business debt. So that would be your mortgage or uh, a secured line of credit or a secured loan from um, uh, somebody you bought the business from. If you're going to include any of that interest debt, you, you have to have an amortization from the lender. And the reason you have to have that is because only the interest portion of that payment counts for forgiveness and the interest and principal portion changes every month. And so you've got to have an amortization that shows those amounts month by month. And then you've also got to have a receipt from the lender you paid or a canceled check. Um, on the business rent uh, side, you've got to have a copy of the lease agreement and you've got to have receipts or canceled checks. And on the utility side, you've got to have copies of the invoices that are dated within that eight week period that started when you got the money and you've got to have receipts or canceled checks. So you have to both prove that the money was due and that you actually paid it and that whoever you paid cashed it. So you're gonna to have to submit copies of those with the uh, forgiveness application. Now here is um, something else that's new and this actually is a little bit tougher. Uh, the forgiveness was written to make you prioritize your payroll. So you have to preserve the 75%, 25% split even if you can't maximize your forgiveness. So if you spend less than um, the, the amount, than 75% of the amount of your loan on payroll, you've also got to reduce the other section on a prorated basis. Just a quick example, if you got a $100,000 loan, 75% um, of that was, uh, was 75 grand for payroll, 25% for other. But let's say during that eight week period, you can only generate about $50,000 in eligible payroll expenses. Well, you've got to redo the ratio. Uh, payroll has to be 75%. So, um, so the other category is now reduced to 17 grand. So you can't just spend 25% on other expenses out the gate. It's got to be in relationship to what you spend on payroll. So that's a little bit tougher. But now here's the good side. The good side on the, um, on the payroll expenses is that the prior guidance stated you, that your eight week period started um, as soon as you got the money. But now they've given you an option for an alternate covered period. So you can delay the start date for your eight week covered period to begin on the date of your first pay period following the date you received your PPP funds. So for a lot of people, that's going to allow you to squeeze in one more pay period to um, the eligible uh, covered period. And so that should help push up your eligible expenses significantly. So now you'll um, start your, your um, covered period for the payroll section on the first date um, of, your, of the payroll after you got the money, and then you'll go eight weeks forward from there. And the other thing they've said is that payroll costs are eligible if they are incurred or paid during the, um, during the covered period. So this should let you pay one pay period and then everything else that's incurred over eight weeks. So it should extend that period of eligibility that, that lets you spend more on payroll and still get it forgiven. Uh, now, you've got to submit verification with your application for forgiveness on the payroll section too. Hopefully, you've got a payroll service who's generating these, um, these verifications for the payrolls that take place during that eight-week period. But if not, then you have to submit bank statements that show where you wrote those checks to your employees. Um, they're also going to want tax forms for the period from both the IRS and the state. So for the IRS, that's probably uh, Form 941 and they're gonna want receipts for payments to any benefit providers. So that's your 401k, your, um, your health uh, healthcare coverage, um, disability insurance, any of those expenses that the employer is paying for the employees, you gotta have receipts from those payment providers. And then um, you've gotta submit documentation so that they can verify you returned 100%. And the application, God help you, but you have to do it for every employee and it gives you three different time periods. You have to show the hours they were working. Um, if you've got regular salaried employees, it's gonna be pretty quick, but if you've got a lot of hourly employees, it's just gonna be a lot of work <laughs> to fill out the tables that they're requesting for each employee to verify um, if you're back to 100%. So um, a little bit more good news. 
we're sure now that different employees count. Uh, again, they're only counting the uh, number of full-time equivalents, but not the same full-time equivalents. Also, the way the form is set up, it looks like the bonuses, commissions, overtime, and wage increases all likely count if they're earned in the covered period, up to the maximum of 15385 That 15385 is um, 100000 a year divided by eight weeks, so that's the maximum limit. So you can't do bonuses or commissions that exceed that amount per employee. But up to that amount, um, if you, so if you run your regular payrolls and it turns out that you're not gonna generate the amount of eligible expenses that'll maximize your forgiveness um, during that period. So now you're in the situation of just having to give that money back or up to this limit per employee, you could maybe do some bonuses um, or overtime pay that would help increase the amount your employees are being paid. So you could actually get that money into your employees' hands instead of just having to give it back to your lender. And then the last thing, this question came up specifically last week before we knew it, but um, you definitely are also able to um, catch up any past due amounts. So if you have some eligible expenses that fall into these uh, categories, um, but they were, um, you know, let's say you deferred some of your utility amounts from a couple months ago, you can go ahead and pay those off during your covered period. Even though they were not incurred during the covered period, they're still going to be eligible expenses. The only catch to that, again, remember, is 75% has to be spent on payroll. So um, subject to that limit, you can catch up some uh, past due expenses. There are uh, some other changes that we found out from this form. Um, the rules have been relaxed around salary reductions of more than 75%. Um, I am not sure who that helps because everybody we've looked at is having trouble spending the um, payroll to get the forgiveness. So if you reduce salaries, you're even further behind on meeting that um, payroll minimum. The other thing is now that we know you've got to reduce the other side, if payroll gets reduced, there's even less of an incentive to actually reduce someone's salaries. I have no idea why they've done this, but if you're in that category, uh, there is some uh, flexibility there and you're, you're gonna get more of your money forgiven than we thought if you had to reduce um, salaries. The other thing is there, um, you're still gonna get forgiveness um, if you do not return to full staffing by June 30th, 2020, um, as long as the reasons you can't return are not your fault. So if you have employees who refuse to return to work or who are fired for cause or resigned or asked for fewer hours, as long as you get documentation of each of those things, um, you can still get full forgiveness, even if you don't return to 100% of the hours that were being worked um, beforehand. But again, um, these are, you're still only gonna get forgiven on eligible expenses, even though these reductions um, even though they've given you some more flexibility to meet their threshold standards for forgiveness at all, you're still only gonna get forgiven on what you actually spent. So if you, um, if you do have fewer people, you're probably gonna get less forgiveness. So that's all I've got. Does anybody have any questions about PPP forgiveness? Josh, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, we, um, we received the PPP loan mm -hmm. um, on April 30th. Mm -hmm. And so we have, we have not reopened. Um, and so that was the biggest question we had is we're just going to run out of time on the eight weeks. And so I think this is good news. You told me that um, it sounds like it can start with our first payroll. Are you saying we just only have one additional week on top of the eight from when it funded? Yeah, it, 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 the latest it can start is your next payroll date from the date you got the money. Okay, so like we're thinking the earliest we can open now is June 15th. We're thinking the latest that it could possibly happen is August 3rd for us. So it doesn't matter within that time period, it can start at eight weeks at that point. No, 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 no. I mean, it's, it's regular payrolls. So um, it just depends on what your uh, business policy is. I mean, when, when do, you, do you normally run weekly payrolls, bi-weekly payrolls, monthly yes. payrolls? Yes, we, we have weekly payrolls. Yes, and so, so, 
So it's, I mean, the, the latest it could start is seven days from April 30th. Wow. Okay. Well, and then Here, here's the, here's the thing you need to think about though. Um, a lot of business owners are in the same position, uh, but to get the forgiveness on that 25%, that's probably the portion you really need. You have to have expended the, the 75% on the payroll. So even if you don't have, even if you're not open, you need to start paying your people at the same rates they were making before the crisis. And you need to do it by that, well, that date's already passed. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's, and again, you know, we have filed, we have, we have 24 employees. We, we closed on March 20th and they're all receiving, you know, unemployment through the state and, you know, and the fed check for the 600 a week. So for, you know, everybody's making double and more and yeah. we've just realized to bring every, you know, even, even if we try to pay them all and really the 25% doesn't help me. I don't have rent. I don't, you know, my interest payments are, are very small. Like I wouldn't even use that. The only way it would really help us is if we could use it for actual real payroll to open our business. So I applied, uh, Bethany for the, cause I, I'm in touch with a lot of other business owners and I heard several that got the, um, the disaster loan and the terms were so awesome with the 30 years and all I applied for that last night in hopes that I could get that instead since we're anticipating, you know, that we'll use very little, you know, of the PPP money. And um, I got a denial this morning saying that they're only issuing it for agricultural business now because of the, you know, just so many applications they've received. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why they didn't make that more clear when they reopened the portal a couple weeks ago. Right. Um, I got really excited to start and I started contacting all the small businesses I knew who hadn't gotten in the queue. And then Josh found a memo, not in the application that said it's only agricultural businesses. So um, but you might need to, to talk with Josh and James separately about the employee retention tax credit at this point, because that would be some benefit to you when you guys reopen. Um, right. the, uh, the deadline to pay back the PPP to be eligible for the ERC was uh, three days ago. Oh, okay. But it doesn't sound like the PPP is going to be useful to you at all. So I would go ahead and pay it back. Um, well, I mean, at one percent, I could utilize. I mean, I I used all my savings, you yeah. know, already. So I've got to have it for that cushion. I got from my personal bank, loaned us a fifty thousand dollar loan, no payment for a year, you know, at BB and T, mm -hmm. which is probably what I'll use just to help the doors get back open. But I mean, yeah, you know, I, I, even if you can't get it forgiven, you've got to have the liquidity. Well, and I think there's a lot of discussion. You know, certainly with the, I know that within, when the House Democrats had this $3 trillion bill in that, they had asking for the PPP to be reworked yes. and not due until December 31st, which I know that's going to fall dead, which is fine. But I think that there's still a lot of talk about moving it to a 16 week period or something. So that's right. our hope. I don't want to send right. it back in case that gets reworked and we can actually use because the 16 weeks would work great for us and we actually could use most of it and most of it we would use on payroll the 25 percent doesn't help us because of what it's for we um we 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 were hopeful about the same thing uh before this forgiveness application actually posted you know there was a lot of chatter that the treasury was going to reduce it to 50 percent uh on payroll right. and 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 but you know that's not what came out now, I mean, one other thing they've said so far is you're responsible for the guidance that came out when that was current when your loan was made. And so, the, you know, everybody's responsible for different rules. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm hopeful for the same. So it sounds to me, though, that, I mean, you're in a, you, you know exactly where you are, which is you've got to have the liquidity regardless of what gets forgiven or, right. or what the repayment terms are. So it sounds to me like, I mean, at least you're not under the gun of having to make a different decision. You know, you've got to have access to that cash. So, you know, I would, I would keep it. I would use it how you have to use it. And yeah, I mean, it's changing day by day. So hopefully we'll get some additional flexibility announced in the next week or two. 
My CPA thinks that there's a possibility that they'll rework it and we would still qualify. You think the same thing, that there's a possibility of that? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to read the tea leaves right now because everybody's so disconnected. But yeah, just last night, Forbes published an article that was exactly the same, that said there's right. a lot of bipartisan pressure on the Treasury. Um, because, I, I mean, the interesting thing is the legislators are getting called from people like us who are on the ground who are saying, well, I mean, this was super helpful, but the way you've issued these uh, guidelines, it's actually, it's hurting some people. So yes, you know, the, the legislators are hearing that very clearly. And I think they're communicating that regularly to the treasury. So hopefully, yeah, I, I'm still hopeful. I agree with you. Um, I do not think this is the end of the line for um, forgiveness advice, but this is what we got right now. Okay. And then one last question. Um, Right now, do you know when you have to file the forgiveness by? It, the, um, I do not think there is a due date on the forgiveness application. James, okay. do you remember different? Um, there's there's one threshold which says 30 days after your period and after the eight weeks. And then there's another, there's a 30, a 60, and a 90 day threshold. And it and it's, talks about when you've got to get the money you know, the reconciliation to the lender and then when the lender's got to get it to the SBA because it's all about the lender getting forgiven, right? I mean, they don't, <laughs> you know, they want to push that, they want to push those loans to the SBA. Um, so it's probably going to be that the lender is going to start asking you to submit the forgiveness is going to be the, what right. pushes the deadline. Well, that makes sense. And I misunderstood or wasn't paying atten enough attention. What were you talking about a minute ago when something has already passed, like concerning oh, us um, for what we had to yeah. do? Yeah. So there's this other program that we were asking a lot of people to consider called the Employee Retention Credit. And basically what it does is it will pay up to half your wages, um, up to $5,000 per employee. Um, and uh, and so that's a really good option. And the way you fund that credit is you just don't pay the federal government payroll taxes. So there's no application process. <laughs> you just transfer the money from, you know, what it would have been federal payroll back over to operating. And right. you can do that whenever. So you can wait till June or July or August um, and take advantage of that program. So, you know, that, that could be a significant amount of money. But the catch is you can only do the PPP or the employee retention credit. You can't do them both. Right. And, um, and so if you've gotten the PPP, they said, well, okay, if you change your mind and you pay back the PPP by May 18th, uh, we'll let you do the employee retention credit instead. But now that, that deadline's passed, so... Okay. And, may, and may, that might change too. I mean, Chris, Good. it sounds like you need the liquidity more, more so than, than that cash and operating on down the road, but That's what it, we'll, we'll, we'll keep our eyes and ears open on that as well. And we can let you know if, if that safe harbor date gets pushed back. I have a feeling that one will, will likely shift as well. Right. Okay. And I wouldn't, I, you know, I just, I stopped talking about it because um, I wouldn't feel too bad about missing it because um it doesn't provide additional liquidity, right? You still right. gotta have enough money coming in the door to be able to fund the um, the, the uh, federal payroll tax to be able to convert it to operating, right? Right. So, I mean, it helps you, it may provide a bigger number of help than the PPP will right now, but it, it's not liquidity. So if liquidity is what you need, you, you're still right to have done the PPP. Well, no, I mean, I, I agree if they would just extend it or like I said, I, I, I don't know. But you, also the thing is you understand if like, so we, we got 150 and if I need to use 25 or 30 of it, we still can take that at the 1% and pay it off within the 24 months, correct? Right. And we can still send back whatever's left. I can still hold on to it just yep. so we know exactly what we need, right? You got it. Okay. And there isn't, and you don't have to pay for seven months. Okay. On the PPP. Right. So. They make the payments for you. Yeah, that's good. I'd heard six, but seven's better. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, it was very helpful. Thank y'all. Yeah. I mean, technically, Christy, just to clarify on that, they don't make the payments for you. They're just letting the interest accrue um, right. during those six months. There, There is on some other SBA loans where they are paying it, but not that one. So Gotcha. 
Um, but anyway, as far as liquidity goes, that is good too right now because we think the rest of 2020, you know, hopefully is like what we're really not sure what we're working with. And then we can get a better sense and it'll be easier for you to run projections and know how much you really need. And you can decide from there how much okay. you want to return or hold on to. Okay. And just one afterthought, Josh, you were saying something about like, if you can't get your employees back and you don't get them all hired back till June 30th, but that still doesn't matter concerning the, the eight weeks or you say nine weeks now, you still, yeah, that, I mean, that April is still in effect. Exactly. And all that stuff's related to forgiveness anyway. So, I mean, it, it's not going to matter if you can't meet the forgiveness thresholds, right? then who cares, right? You're just looking at that um, 17 month payback period. I wish they would just let us take the PPP and turn it into the, the yeah, idle loan you know, right. with, know. with the 30 year, you know, great terms. Know. Cause that'd be so much more beneficial to businesses. And the reason we've gotten into this situation, there's still PPP money available to borrow because they put what at the end of the day, it was $700 billion that went into PPP. Oh, well, I, I heard that too. That a lot it, of people just aren't taking it, you know, or sending it because you're just too handcuffed to use it. It's, it's more stress to figure it out then, you know, if they really wanted to help, if we could just get, look, you can use this, you know, 30, 30, 30, you know, 30%, you know, for yeah. overhead, 30 for labor, you know, so, so you could, you know, get up and running. Well, and I don't, I don't really understand why they didn't do the same thing for EIDL, why they didn't, the reason they stopped taking EIDL applications is because Congress didn't appropriate enough money for them to continue doing so. Right. And the thing about the EIDL money is it's actually going to get paid back unlike the 700 billion they put in the PPP, I wish they had just fully funded EIDL so that people had, Yeah, like you're saying. I, the I completely agree. Like, I just wish I could take this 150 and turn it into that loan because, yeah. you know, it would, it would put a whole lot less pressure to, to figure out how we're going to work this. So, yes. Well, thank y'all again. You're welcome. Sure. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Uh, Jim or Gwen, did y'all have any questions? Yes, I do. And first of all, Christy, uh, thanks for asking so many questions because that answered a lot of the questions we had on our list. So <laughs> yeah, that, that was good. I appreciate your help. Well, it's good uh, to hear from you, Jim. <laughs> you, you as well. You as well. We um, found out uh, yesterday afternoon that we'd actually, our money had been deposited. We had not checked the bank in a week. So our money went into the bank uh, on May 12th which would give us um, oh, to the first week in July for the eight weeks. We are planning to reopen on Thursday, June 4th for a shortened week for a couple of weeks, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, but um, we may rethink that as well. But right now the plans are to reopen on Thursday the 4th and uh, be open three days a week until about the last part of June and then, then go back to our regular hours. But uh, Gwen is also on the line. Uh, from her house, yeah, I'm here at the office right now. She and I will get together when she gets in shortly, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions for you on the form. I've already printed out the um, forgiveness form uh, that we have to populate at some point, and I'm sure I'll have some questions for y'all on that, just clarification. But, uh, our amount was um, a relatively small amount to begin with because we don't have much in the way of a staffing anyway. Most of our work is part-time. We we applied and received thirty nine thousand dollars, so it's not a not a huge amount, but at um, at this point, every every forty thousand dollars helps anyway. So. Amen, absolutely. But yeah, we'll be here for both of y'all. So if you have individual questions, you start filling out the sheets, or if anything else comes up, just let us know. Okay, we sure will, Josh and James and Bethany. Thank you, and Chris, good to hear from you too. Hmm. Yeah, glad you all could join us this morning. And yeah, Christy too, don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, individually. As you, you know, if we learn more about these forgiveness things and we, we can be of help, don't hesitate. To email Absolutely, y'all had a lot of good information. Thank you. I really did, thank y'all for your help. Good thing, I hope y'all have a good rest of the day. Y'all too. too. Bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.